Hello, everyone, and come, welcome back to our seminar series. I'm Gabriel Lignani. I'm co-chairing this series with Dimitri Kuhlman here. Hi. And, and uh, it's a pleasure to have Chris Dalla with us today. And I will briefly introduce him in, in a moment. A um, few things. I. Uh, because a few of you asked me uh, how many people were present in, in, in the previous talks, I put now the option that you can see how many attendees there are. So if you are curious, you can see it. And a um, few things, you can ask questions using the Q and A. We prefer at the end of the talks, but if you have some burning question, you can ask in the chat before, and we can ask it to Chris. And uh, we will, we prefer, if you ask the, the question in person, so we will give you the possibility to speak. If you don't want, you can write the question, that's it. And uh, this talk has been uh, recorded and it will be on YouTube in the next week. So you can rewatch it if you are interested. So, okay. If in any, I think that I didn't miss anything this time. We forget anything. So, a brief introduction. So Chris is an associate professor in the Department of Neuroscience at the Tufts University School of Medicine. He has been trained by, um, for his PhD by Kevin Staley. And then he did a, a postdoc with John Huguenard. And then in 2010, he started at Tufts. He is now chair of the Basic Science Committee America Epilepsy Foundation. And is also the co-chair till next year, I think of the Gordon Conference on Mechanism of Epilepsy and Neuronal Synchronization that many of you know very well, probably. He received uh, prestige awards, such as the William Lennox uh, Postdoctoral Fellow, uh, sponsored by the American Epilepsy Society, also the uh, Young Investigator Award by the American Epilepsy Society, and also the Landis Award for Outstanding Mentorship by an NINDS investigator. So, Throughout his career, he has explored the synaptic and network level changes, uh, which transform the healthy brain into a brain that generates seizures. And uh, his research group has focused on how glutamate signaling is regulating both the developing and mature cerebral cortex, and how destruction of the glutamate signaling can predispose the brain to seizures. Just to mention a few of them, his past work includes the epileptogenic and metabolic changes in the cerebral cortex following traumatic brain injury, also glutamine transport in the developing cortex and how glutamine uh, reuptake is altering cortical malformations, the rule of astrocyte secretive factor in immediate injury induced epileptogenic processes, and the rule of, for example, the beta catenin protein, the pathophysiology of infantile spasms. Recently, uh, his group reported that NR2D and MDA receptor play also an important role in the maturation in, of inhibitor interneurons in the somatosensory cortex. So today, his talk has a very intriguing title, I have to say, Playing Fast and Loose with Glutamate Builds Healthy Circuits in the Developing Cortex. So I'm very happy to have you here with us, Chris, and we're ready to go. Cool. Thank you so much, Gabrielle, for the introduction and to having me here and Dimitri as well. It's really fun to be here. I can't wait to hear what you guys think about some of our work. And yeah, always guilty of trying to come up with some cute title for my talk. So sorry about that. Um, I will be talking about uh, NR2D uh, and interneuron. So um, I'll get right into it. And again, thanks for having me. And I definitely am um, excited to hear questions and discussion at the end. Sorry, Chris, we are seeing now your um, presenter. Oh. Yeah, if you got can. it. Thank you. Let's see if I can do this right. Is that better? Yes. Perfect. Thanks for letting me know. Okay. Um, so, um, as you heard, I'm really interested in glutamate signaling. I'm very interested in astrocytes and early development. So, um, I'm going to tell you a project today that was started in my lab in the last few years by. Um, Moritz Armbrester, who's now a faculty member, um, Liz Hansen, who is now a postdoc at Baylor, and Zinwan Klaft, who's a current postdoc in my lab, along with a host of other people who I'll you know, give a shout out to as I go along the way. 
Um, and it, it really focuses on what happens in early development due to dynamic maturation of astrocytes. So let's start with just thinking about astrocytes. So here's some astrocytes labeled with um, uh, TD tomato. And you can see when we reconstruct them, they have these really beautiful structures. They have um, very fine processes, as you can see here in the shaded areas that go out and touch synapses, fill the neuropil. And in all those places, they do all the interesting things that astrocytes do, like take up glutamate, they buffer potassium, they provide metabolic support, um, they interact with vasculature, they do a lot of different things. And those functional properties can be shaped um, and altered in many ways. So, for example, um, you know, development, which I'll talk about today, is a, is a very strong modulator of astrocyte function. And as astrocytes mature, they, they take on all different roles. Um, likewise, during injury, seizures, inflammation, you know, there's all kinds of different things that can perturb this both physical and biochemical interaction that astrocytes have with neurons and with synapses. And today, uh, I'm going to really focus on um, how astrocytes control extracellular glutamate, um, excitatory neurotransmitter, as I'm sure all you know, and how that effectively controls NMDA receptor activation. What I'm going to focus on is NMDA's, uh, NMDA receptors. Uh, of the NR2D subtype that are expressed by GABAergic interneurons and um, how that shapes their development, how astrocytes immaturity early in development which helps drive the formation of GABAergic circuits. And, you know, from a big picture point of view, kind of one thing I really think a lot about is how do glutamate and NMDA receptors act as a signaling axis for all different aspects of development, but particularly for epileptic encephalopathies. I'm very interested in developmental epilepsies and how some of the key components of glutamatergic excitation um, are linked to um, seizures and um, all kinds of different intellectual disabilities and behavioral problems. Um, and that comes from a lot of human genetic data and also experimental data. And so for, um, to zoom in on what I'm gonna talk about today, the non-cute title of my talk is um, Glu-N2D Containing NMDA Receptors in GABAergic Interneuron Development. So we published a paper um, last year uh, on this subject, and so I'll, I'll review that paper and, and um, throw in some new uh, unpublished data that kind of moves the story along. And then I'll, I'll kind of at the end reframe some of our ideas into a, a bit of a big picture about how we think early life glutamate signaling shapes cortical network maturation and how that can predispose networks to dysfunction. So what I'm going to talk about today is, first of all, Glutamate, sig glutamate signaling in the developing brain, um, it's unregulated by astrocytes. That's the, that's the point I want you to take home from the first part of the talk. And then we'll discuss how that uh, inability of astrocytes to take up glutamate leads to parvalbumin positive interneuron activation through GLUN2D, a unique and interesting NMDA receptor. Um, from there, we'll talk about how disrupting that GLUN2D signal causes inhibitory network dysfunction and circuit hyperexcitability. And at the end, I'll, I'll highlight some new unpublished data looking at how other interneuron subtypes are altered and how we think GLUN2D and ambient glutamate signaling plays a larger role in circuit formation. So jump right in, early cortical development in astrocytes. What's going on? So what I'm going to focus on today is glutamate. And there's two primary glutamate transporters called the GLT1 and GLAST. They are broadly expressed in, in all different brain tissues. So here's an example of an immunostain um, from an adult uh, rat section. And you can see in green, you know, glutamate transporter GLT-1 labeled. It's kind of everywhere. It has this little punctate staining where those fine astrocyte processes are getting in and touching all the synapses. And um, I'll, I'll highlight just the way that GLT-1 in these transporters work is they couple moving glutamate against its concentration gradient into astrocytes through a driving force from the sodium gradient. So that's what allows these little molecular machines to take glutamate in the extracellular space, bind it, and move it into the intracellular space of astrocytes, where it can be degraded and recycled. Now, in doing that, it does a number of critical things for brain function. It keeps extracellular glutamate levels low, it prevents excitotoxicity, and it maintains the spatial and um, temporal specificity of glutamate signaling. So if you've got something like a transporter out there binding up glutamate and taking it up all the time, when glutamate's released, it has a hard time diffusing away and activating other synapses. So it helps kind of encapsulate that glutamate signaling. And as a um, piece of evidence for you know, why this is so important, um, knocking out GLT-1 leads to lethal seizures in mice, as you can see from this um, kind of classic paper from Tanaka. 
Uh, one thing I always kind of uh, stop and pause at is that GLT-1 is about 1% of brain protein. So it's hugely expressed and its, it's function is critical to um, maintaining healthy circuits and to brain development. So let's think about it in development. You know, as I just mentioned, uh, GLT-1 is very strongly expressed, but that's not the case early in life. So here is a in situ hybridization study for a GLT-1 transcript. Um, you know, going back a few years here, and you can see in the adult brain, GLT-1 is everywhere, right? It's cortex, hippocampus, you name it. In early in development, that's not really the case. There's very little GLT-1. And as the animals mature, um, the same is true in humans, you kind of have this deferential gradient of ex expression, where expression starts in the deeper structures, hippocampus, and then finally it seems to come on last in the cerebral cortex, as you can kind of see by this absence of labeling at P10. And we wanted to confirm that um, when we were started getting interested in this a few years ago. And so what uh, Liz Hansen and uh, some people in the lab did was to quantify glutamate uptake in the developing cortex. And what they found was that, you know, this, this in situ that we kind of gleaned this piece of data from, um, when we looked at protein expression, we saw the exact same thing, which is that in the cortex, there's very, very little GLT-1. Um, hippocampus, you know, it doesn't have very much early in life either here at P3, but uh, cortex has even less. So there's this situation unique to early development where astrocytes do not express GLT-1 and they're not buffering glutamate through uptake. And we became interested in that because, as you know, glutamate can act on a lot of receptors. And here's a crystal structure of one of the NMDA receptors. I probably don't need to give too much intro, but we're, we're very interested in NMDA receptors for a lot of reasons. They bind glutamate and they're activate, activated by it. They're incredibly important in learning and memory. They're thought of as coincidence detectors between activity and neurotransmission. And that's because they're normally blocked by magnesium. So when glutamate um, is present, the receptor is normally blocked unless the postsynaptic cell is depolarized, kicking out the magnesium block and allowing the receptor to activate. We know that these receptors play a very important role in interneuron maturation. There's a lot of evidence pointing to that. And we also know they're, they're implicated in multiple neurological diseases. For today, you know, epilepsy is for sure one of them, schizophrenia, there's a number of other um, neurological disorders that uh, are highly related to NMDA receptor dysfunction. So with this piece of data that we had saying that, NM, that glutamate transporters are not present, not functional in the developing brain, and the known role of interneuron, or of, uh, sorry, of NMDA receptors in early circuit formation, we asked, um, are, are NMDA receptors constrained by glutamate transporter in the, in the neonatal brain as they normally would be in the mature brain? So let me kind of walk you through an experiment to demonstrate that in fact, they're not. They're not controlled by, NM, by glutamate transporters at all. So here's a um, pulse cell current recording from in a P28 rat cortex. And uh, what you see in black is a, a recording of an NMDA current, pharmacologically isolated. And this little gray bar is electrical stimulation that we deliver to evoke the NMDA current. So glutamate's being released, binds NMDA receptors, and creates this current. Now, if we come in and pharmacologically inhibit glutamate transporters with a drug called TBOA, we potentiate the NMDA response. And what that means is that under normal conditions, the transporters are functioning to limit NMDA receptor activation. And when you block them, they stop doing that and NMDA receptors become more activated. So this difference between this black and the red line is the role that astrocytic glutamate transporters are playing in controlling NMDA receptors. So if you look earlier, P7, um, you can see that same experiment when we, when we apply the glutamate transporter inhibitor, there's very little potentiation of the signal. So what that tells us is that at that time point, early in development, astrocytes are not controlling glutamate signaling through GLT-1 or other glutamate transporters. And just to highlight the uniqueness of the situation in the cortex, if we look at hippocampus, even at the same very young time point, um, there is glutamate transporter constraining NMDA receptors. So this cortical development um, and the relationship between NMDA receptors and astrocytes is unique. And the, what we believe it does is it creates a unique developmental window in which um, astrocytes, or so astrocytes are not constraining NMDA receptors and allowing um, uh, whatever glutamate's kind of floating around to act wherever it wants. So um, next thing we started to wrestle with was, well, what does that do? Why, why does that exist? And 
Um, does it have any functional role? We, we were thinking about this and we thought, it seems like kind of a bad way to design a system to have an excitatory neurotransmitter go unconstrained. So, you know, it's kind of reason, well, maybe it's doing something that we should care about. So we thought about it. And one of the things that kind of came to mind was that there's more than just what we call phasic glutamate neurotransmission, which is the release of a synaptic vesicle crossing a synaptic cleft and activating um, a postsynaptic receptor. There's also what's known as ambient or tonic excitation through glutamate. And just to define that, ambient glutamate is the resting concentration of glutamate in the extracellular space. So once that glutamate's been released, you know, the level and it's taken back up, the levels in the neuro, in the, in the extracellular space don't go to zero. There's some resting amount of glutamate floating around. And what sets that is the, con the, the, um, the relationship between glutamate release, which can come from many sources and the uptake by astrocytes. And just to tie a quick parallel, um, this is well studied for GABAergic systems. We know that GABA um, provides tonic inhibition of circuits and cells. And for glutamate, a lot less is known about it, but I think there's, hopefully at the end of the talk, you'll, you'll be convinced that there's an important role for tonic um, glutamatergic excitation. Um, so back to this, uh, yeah, the ambient level is set by the relationship between uptake and release. So in the neonatal brain, when there's not much uptake, our prediction is pretty simple that ambient glutamate could be higher. And if so, it could activate neurons that express NMDA receptors. So the first question we asked was, is this right? Is there really elevated ambient glutamate in the early developing brain? And so now I'm gonna highlight a, a number of pieces of data from our paper from 2019 that we went in and investigated this. The first of which is um, we, we use glutamate imaging to monitor glutamate levels. That's one thing I'm, I'm always having fun doing in the lab is kind of thinking up new um, ways to quantify neurotransmitters. We like to use imaging modalities. And this is one that um, has served us well over the years. It's called the glutamate biosensor. And if you're interested, we can talk about it at the end. But basically what it lets you do is gives a rough approximation of glutamate levels. Um, it's not quantitative in terms of micromolar, but you can see levels change either with stimulation or with neuronal activity, and in this case, through development. So what we found was when we looked from P5 to P10 and uh, used this glutamate biosensor as a way to quantify glutamate levels, we saw that glutamate levels decreased during that time. So early in development, they're higher, and a few days later, they drop. So that fits with our model, that lack of glutamate uptake um, results in elevated extracellular glutamate. And the timeline of this is kind of matching the time course of glutamate transporter expression. So it starts to kick in around P10, and it's fully there by about P21. Now, we were not fully satisfied with that, so we uh, undertook a big experiment to actually quantify how much glutamate is in the extracellular space during early development. And I'll skip the, the brutal details. <laughs> the person who did this work, Liz Hansen, was really um, you know, pushing her technical skill to the limit, anyone's technical skill. These are tough experiments. Basically, what you do is you create a concentration curve to NMDA and glutamate, and then you use agonists and antagonists um, to um, place yourself on this curve and doing in doing that you can qu you can quantify the exact concentration and so in early development Liz found that the ambient glutamate concentration was about 100 nanomolar and uh, you know by p14 a couple of weeks later it had dropped to 50. so again our, our our hunch was right if you don't have transporters you get elevated ambient glutamate um, it's specific to early development so even by p10 p14 you know levels start to drop and we, again, kind of went back to the drawing board and asked, OK, so glutamate's elevated. Does that have a, a functional consequence? Is that important for anything? And again, sort of scratching our heads, diving into the literature, uh, Liz, who was driving this project at that time, came to me and said, hey, we should think about some NMDA receptors that are, are uniquely expressed in development. So let me pause and highlight some functional properties of NMDA receptors you may or may not be aware of and some weird variants that I definitely didn't know about when I started this project. Um, and use this great paper from uh, Pierre Pauletti that I highly recommend if you're interested in NMDA receptor diversity. So the NMDA receptors that we normally think of are GLUN2A um, and GLUN2B coupled to a GLUN1. And GLUN2A is thought as a, a mature form, GLUN2B is an early developmental form. And they have different time constants, different affinities, all kinds of different properties. But there's also a couple of other interesting flavors of glutamate receptors, of NMDA receptors. And I'm going to highlight one called GLUN2D. Okay, so let's talk about its unique properties. The first unique property that it has is its high affinity. 
So it can bind and be activated by glutamate when it, glutamate levels are as low as, you know, in the hundreds of micromolar. So early in life, when we calculated that there was about 100 micromolar glutamate, we are in a range which gluN2D could be activated, where other receptors are, would be less likely. The other interesting component of um, gluN2D biophysics is that it's less blocked by magnesium. So it still has an affinity for magnesium, but um, not the same as gluN2A and gluN2B. So what that tells us is that it doesn't function in the same way as a coincidence detector probably because it doesn't need to be depolarized to kick out a magnesium ion. It's just not blocked at rest. And in considering all these properties together, uh, gluin 2 is highly sensitive to glutamate. It's not blocked by magnesium. I didn't mention this specifically, but it um, has long open times. We thought that that could lead to tonic activation. So if there's ambient glutamate being elevated and a receptor being expressed that um, has um, the uh, potential to be tonically activated, maybe it's doing something interesting. And that's kind of the lock and key of the elevated glutamate and the unique NMDA receptor. I started to get really interested in NR2D um, thanks to some fantastic literature that's out there from human genetics and from people like Steve Trinalis, who's been working on um, all of these different NMDA receptors for a long, long time. So we know that mutations in NR2D cause epilepsy. Um, and we also know that some of these other receptors, these other genes or proteins that control glutamate signaling are intimately linked. And this is kind of what got me to that first idea that disruption of early glutamate um, could be a signaling axis for epilepsy and particularly in epileptic encephalopathies. So I'll highlight a couple of really great papers. One is this brain paper um, from 2019. It highlights that NMDA receptor mutations, GRIN2 D mutations can be both gain and loss of function. And it's often difficult to predict the functional consequence of the receptor mutation. Um, Another nice paper a couple years earlier showing that um, particular that specifically gain of function mutations in NR2D can lead to epilepsy and induce, induce cell death. And that makes sense if you have an uncontrolled excitatory current, you're going to have a lot of you know bad things happening. The other two proteins that I'll highlight are GLT1, the transporter that controls glutamate, and GLAS, which is sort of a backup transporter. They're both also linked to severe developmental epilepsies. So there's a lot of kind of fingers pointing to this, this area of early glutamate signaling. It, it definitely captivated us for the last few years. If you dive into, uh, I'll highlight the brain paper. If you dive into some of the specific mutations, you can see um, you know, these guys map them onto the NMDA receptor. They, a lot of them um, tend to be in the pore and they create a bunch of interesting changes in how NMDA receptors function. So they can change affinity for glutamate, for other co-ligands. They can change gating and open times. Interestingly, most of them seem to decrease surface expression of the NMDA receptor. So even if it's a gain of function mutation, making the receptor more sensitive or carrying more current, um, they tend to also lead to lack of expression. So what could look like a gain of function may actually be a loss of function if the protein doesn't make it to the surface. Um, and so I'll highlight two that I found particularly interesting in this paper and are maybe relevant to my long-term interest in, in studying epilepsy. So here's um, one patient who has an NR2D mutation in this case, thought to be gain of function, um, it leads to enhanced potency of the uh, agonist, reduced proton inhibition, which is an aspect of NMDA receptors I haven't really touched on. Um, but again, loss of current and surface expression. So it's a bit difficult to tell if it's gain or loss of function. In this case, it was uh, the patient had severe epilepsy, developmental delays, delays and autism. And a different mutation that I think is equally interesting is um, a clear loss of function mutation where you have decreased um, co-ligand um, uh, potency, decreased open probability, decreased surface expression, in this case, linked to severe developmental epilepsy, infantile spasms, and you can see clearly on the EEG hypsarrhythmia. So again, like I'm just kind of following this path from basic, basically understanding how astrocytes mature and control glutamate to some really interesting clinical implications for how control of glue and 2D signaling might be involved in epilepsy. So from there, we jump back to the, you know, the just basic science, nuts and bolts. How does this work? What is gluin 2 d doing? Where is it expressed? So looking back into literature, this is a beautiful study from Hannah Monnier from, um, I think, over 25 years ago. She showed that gluin 2 d as detected by in situ, is clearly expressed widely in the brain, but um, particularly in cortex, in this case, P7. This falls right into our developmental window where we think glutamate is elevated and could activate NR2D. Um, jump forward a few years, people were trying to figure out what cell types these were expressed in. And then in the, in the adult brain, um, 
again with some in situ that highlights some of the, the limits of this there's not great antibodies for nr2d um, they showed that the 2d um, transcript was mostly expressed in interneurons as labeled by gad67 so what we did was we wanted to show that this was actually in the developing brain expressed by interneurons so we came back and we did um, RNA scope looking at expression of GAD, again, a marker of interneurons in gluon 2D, and showed that sure enough, there was a nice overlap. So now we can say with confidence that in the developing brain, gluon 2D is expressed by interneurons. And we also confirmed this developmental timeline. If you look at P3, you can see there's very little labeling for NR2D. Come back just a few days later and you see this expression start. So we know developing interneurons express gluon 2D. Does this lead to the tonic activation of developing um, interneurons? Um, if we know that glutamate levels are high and there's a receptor being expressed that can be tonically activated, you should be able to activate interneurons. And so we, we set to test that, and the idea being that pyramidal cells express normal NMD receptors that don't drive tonic activation, and interneurons don't. So if you have, interneurons have NR2D, which can drive tonic activation. So if you have elevated glutamate, they can be depolarized. Um, and we set out to test that. One sort of trick that I'll point you guys to is if you're interested in, develop, in developing PV interneurons, it can be really challenging to understand them because PV doesn't start expressing until about P14 or so. So if you want to look at really young, um, what will become PV interneurons, it's, it can be tricky. So I'll just highlight this uh, mouse that's a GAD42, or sorry, G42, GAD1, EGFP. You can see it allows us to label interneurons in green, um, not SST. Um, not calretinin, and you can see here's there's no PV, but we're labeling interneurons that will go on to be PV. And um, again, if you're interested, check our paper. There's a couple nice papers about this. You can use the physiological properties to really convince yourself that you're studying immature PV interneurons. So with that, we set out to ask a simple question: Are these developing PV interneurons tonically depolarized by NR2D? Um, to do this, we did um, current clamp recordings where we just let the cells sit at their normal resting memory potential and patch either excitatory neurons or these PV uh, precursor cells. And we first added a PV, a pan blocker of NMDA receptors. And we see that the interneurons hyperpolarize, not very much, but by a few millivolts, and the pyramidal cells do not. So that fits with our model that ambient glutamate is acting at NR2D receptors to tonically activate developing PV interneurons. And that is not seen in pyramidal cells. To show that this is due to NR2D, we used a, a compound called DQP1105 that was developed by the Trinellis lab. And I'll highlight um, a caveat of this, which is that it cannot discriminate between 2C and 2D. There's no drugs out there that I'm aware of that do that very well. But what this allows us to do is discriminate between 2C and D versus all other receptors. And we repeated the same experiment that I just showed you. And sure enough, we saw a very similar effect, which is that when you use a drug that blocks gluon 2D, C and D, you see that interneurons hyperpolarize and pyramidal cells do not. So same thing as before. And when we quantified this, that NR2D containing receptors um, mediated about 75% of the inhibition, of, sorry, of the activation of the interneuron. Now our model has some very specific temporal components that are uh, you can predict, which is that there should be a brief window of, of tonic activation due to the combined expression of GLT1 and NR2D. And so what we did here was we looked at this um, effect of um, NMDA receptor activation really precisely through early development. And what we saw was sure enough, there was this very specific time window in which gluon 2D acted. It was P7 to P8. Before that, at P4, there wasn't much activation because there's no 2D expression, that's what we think. And just a few days later, P10 to P12, um, there's less tonic activation, and we believe that's due to increased expression of uh, glutamate transporters. Now, the other thing that we showed recently, um, this is work by Zinn, is that this NR2D activation leads to enhanced synaptic inhibition. So in this case, what we do is we record from excitatory neurons, uh, record IPSCs. So every, each one of these little upward deflections is an inhibitory current. And then we add acutely add DQP to block NR2D. And we can see we get a decrease in the frequency of synaptic inhibition and a decrease in the amplitude of IPSCs. So not only is um, gluon 2D tonically activating the interneurons, it's promoting synaptic inhibition, which makes sense. Um, and importantly, Zinn did a nice control experiment where he added, added DMSO and saw that that wasn't the case and to show that you know, we have stable recordings over time um, and that this effect isn't due to just rundown of our cell. Um, 
So at this point, we felt very confident saying that ambient glutamate tonically depolarizes PV interneurons and drives synaptic inhibition. And we next asked, does this tonic inhibition, tonic activation lead to something long-term and, and does it help circuits form? So to um, address that, we use an in vivo pharmacological approach. Here you can see schematically sketched out in early life of a mouse. We treated animals with DQP1105 in vivo with IP injection on three days, P7, 8, and 9, overlapping with our window of um, tonic activation of the PV cells. And then we came back a couple weeks later and we assayed inhibitory circuit function. So we looked at mini IPSCs, GABAergic staining, interneuron morphology, and we looked at circuit function in a slice model. And across the board, we found that this 2D signal was important for driving synaptic maturation uh, of inhibitory circuits. So the first thing we did was we recorded mini IPSCs. And now here we, we're using a, a bit of a different internal solution. So just to be clear, now our IPSCs are downward going. So all these little deflections are um, inhibitory GABAergic currents recorded from excitatory neurons. And we asked if animals had been treated in vivo with this drug, DQP, to block NR2D receptors, does that um, affect the amount of synaptic inhibition. And sure enough, it does. Uh, this brief three-day treatment to inhibit NMDA receptors, NR2D receptors, leads to a long-term change in the amount of um, inhibitory synaptic currents that we saw. So a decrease in the frequency with no change in the amplitude. And importantly, we, we did a, a kind of a cool control where we, instead of treating from P7 to P9, we moved our window of drug treatment just a few days later to P11 to P13, that's a time window in which we don't think interneurons are tonically depolarized. So it's a control for you know, the timing of all of this. And what we saw there was that there was no change in synaptic inhibition, um, further supporting that there's this, this unique kind of tight little developmental window which NR2D is playing a role. Um, we went on to confirm that um, anatomically we saw fewer inhibitory synapses. So here's uh, immunostaining of a uh, VGAT gafferin co-labeling to label those inhibitory synaptic um, components. And we see, um, similar to the IPSCs, a small but significant loss of inhibitory um, terminals or inhibitory synapses. And we also filled PV interneurons with biocytin, reconstructed them. And as you can see here, the DQP treated animals had a less complex um, interneuron morphology, PV morphology. Um, we quantify that doing shoal analysis and counting branch points, and in both cases, treatment with DQP to block NMDA receptors early in life led to um, less complicated dendritic morphology. We also cut acute brain slices from P21 animals and asked, how, do this, how does the circuit function? So in a normal cortical um, section, if you stimulate the ascending white matter, record a field potential in layer 5, what you see is a very brief um, and small response because those circuits are so controlled by inhibitory um, cells, inhibitory neurotransmission. If we look at the DQP treated animals, we see something that pops up in a lot of kind of slice hyperexcitability models, injury models, things that are sort of associated with epilepsy or epileptic activity. We see these high frequency components, these prolonged um, field potentials. And we only see that in animals treated with DQP from P7 to P9. And again, coming and treating a little later, we don't see this. So what we think we can say at this point and what we published was that uh, in vivo blockade with uh, DQP, a C, C, uh, gluon 2 C and D blocker from P7 to P9, disrupts inhibitory, cor inhibitory cortical circuits and leads to hyperexcitability. So now we'll kind of jump off into some uh, uh, unpublished data and ask, you know, what does this do and where, where should we start thinking uh, about what the implications of this are? So one thing we were really interested in was is this unique to the somatosensory cortex? We know that different cortical regions develop with different timelines. Are there different critical windows in which this relationship between astrocytes and NR2D um, is unique? Is it more powerful in some regions, less than others? Um, we also are interested in if this is unique to PV cells. There's lots of interneurons. I don't need to tell this group the complexity of interneurons. We've only looked at PV so far. And then also, as I mentioned, our drugs are not ideal. They can't delineate between 2 and C, 2C and 2D. So we've started to use some genetic approaches and I'll just show you some, some new data showing that all of the effects that we see are mediated by 2D. So the first place we started to look um, besides somatosensory cortex is prefrontal cortex. And I'll show you some behavioral data in a second that um, highlights why. So we moved to PFC, um, frontal cortex, and we again just started patching PV cells. And interestingly, we saw a lot of spontaneously active cells there. Um, they're firing away. Um, 
And we first looked at the silent cells, the ones that were not firing. And you can see we put on DQP or DMSO. And, and again, you see this uh, hyperpolarization due to NR2D. And when Zinn quantified that data, again, you can see a small but significant change, again, on the order of a few millivolts. Vehicle controls do not show that. And here, interestingly, if we did this experiment in an NR2D knockout animal, we can see there's no, um, there's no change in the memory potential due to blocking NR2D. And also, we, we're not quite there yet, but when I look at this, it sort of seems like there's a lot less variability in the memory potential um, in the knockouts in here. So we're kind of thinking about that as well. Where the story got really interesting was when we started to look at these 45% these of firing cells. So even though we only have a small um, change in the, the resting memory potential driven by gluon 2D, we have pretty strong ability to inhibit spontaneous action potential firing with, um, by blocking gluon 2D. So you can see here, spontaneously firing cell, put on DQP, it shuts off. It's not always that powerful. Sometimes the frequency just goes down. And again, in a DMSO control, we don't see that. So telling us we have nice stable recordings. And these are not trivial. Like it's hard to patch at this age a little bit. And, you know, maintaining stable firing rates um, is also not always so simple. So this is an important control to show that this isn't just the cell running down or dying. We next shifted to somatostatin expressing interneurons, which are another MGE derived GABAergic cell. And the thing that jumped out of us here was that almost all of the cells were spontaneously firing. Um, less so in the knockout and less so at young ages. But again, we're patching um, P7 to P9 and looking at these spontaneously firing cells, and we see something very similar, which is that the somatostatin cells fire away. You put on DQP and the cell stops firing. In this case, we have a different control. We're putting all the pieces together for this. We don't have it all yet, but in, here we had a knockout animal and you can see DQP did not affect the firing rate. So we now feel a lot more comfortable saying that um, DQP, even though it's not particularly selective for D over C, um, the genetic support that the functions that we're interested in are driven by gluon 2D. And again, you know, nice solid change in the firing rate, not seen in the knockout. So we're now trying to, to zoom out a little bit and look at how early cortical network activity is controlled by gluon 2D. So we're switching to an imaging modality, and here you can see a, a still frame of a movie from a BGAC Cree Cam K um, G Camp 6 mouse. Um, where we can see all interneurons um, and their calcium activity is a measure of their um, spontaneous firing. And this is just a single piece of data just to show you what we're thinking about is, you know, we can get cells firing, um, spontaneous activity, we can put on DQP, we see a lot of the cells appear to shut off, not all. Here's one that seems to kind of turn on. So it's not so clear that all of this interneuron activity is shut down by gluon 2D. And just to highlight the way we're doing this right now, we're seeing all interneurons. So there's a lot of interesting stuff here. We're very curious in how gluon 2D maybe sets the, um, the expression of uh, sort of groups of cells, ensembles of cells. Is that part of what it does? Um, and we're focusing on this early ages again because you know that's when the spontaneous activity happens. If you look a little later, just in all our other data, the, a lot of these phenomena are gone. So you know to kind of Pause and, and summarize again, gluon 2D drives tonic activation and spontaneous firing of PV cells and SST cells. So now we're kind of including more interneurons in this gluon 2D story in the prefrontal cortex. Um, does gluon 2D play a broader role in circuit maturation? So let me kind of highlight the weakness of what I've showed you so far is that we're really just zooming in on a couple cell types and a couple contributors to synaptic activity. Um, in reality, the circuit's much more complicated. We just added SST cells. There's a lot of other cells. I'm still keeping this pretty basic. And what we are interested in and what that hyperexcitability phenotype suggests is that feed forward inhibition may be disrupted in the animals that uh, have gluon 2D disrupted. So feed forward inhibition, as I'm sure most of you know, you have direct excitation onto a, a pyramidal cell and disynaptic inhibition through a PV cell to shut off um, the activity that's been evoked. What's interesting, and I want to highlight a couple of really beautiful papers um, from the Fischel lab and from the Butts lab, this formation of feed forward inhibition is critically reliant on, on an early circuit that's transiently there from somatostatin cells to PV cells. If this gets disrupted, then the formation of feed forward inhibition is compromised. Because we know that gluon2D is driving the spontaneous activity of these SST cells, we simply ask, well, is this feed forward circuit also being disrupted? And again, we don't have the whole story, but we are starting to put pieces together. And we used a similar in vivo approach where we 
inhibited gluN2D for a few days in early development. And now we're going to come a little bit earlier, and what we're going to do is we're going to assay excitation onto the interneurons to ask that first question, do they get the same input from excitation that they should be getting? Um, so we patch clamp PV interneurons and recorded spontaneous EPSCs. And here you can see there's, there's a robust increase in excitation onto interneurons between P7 and P12, um, right in our window of gluN2D activation. And if we looked at animals that were, oh, sorry, animals that were treated with DQP, we see that there's a loss of this excitation, both in the frequency of synaptic excitation and the amplitude. So this does suggest that inhibiting gluN2C and D early in life disrupts excitation later and potentially plays a role in feed forward inhibition. Zooming out to some in vivo um, assays, we, um, we did a behavioral battery on some of these animals that were treated with DQP. And we found that there's kind of a lot of subtle changes, but the one that really jumped out at us was in what's called PPI or pre-pulse inhibition. The idea is that if you have a conditioning tone before a, a very loud tone, um, the conditioning tone will inhibit the startle response. And this is a circuit that functions in the PFC along with other regions. It's reliant on inhibition and it's disrupted in um, patients with schizophrenia. And interestingly, we saw this compromise, um, specific, we saw that PPI was compromised specifically in male mice, um, not in females, so there's some sex specific effect, but it does show us that there may be um, reason to kind of go after some of these behavioral changes that may rely on early activation of NR2D receptors. I will also say that the manipulations I've showed you so far, none of them cause epilepsy. So we've recorded EEG, We've given animals canic acid to see if they have an increased response. That brief window of blocking NR2D doesn't seem to um, lead to epilepsy. So we really haven't cracked that nut of what does NR2D do to drive um, the formation of epileptic circuits, as we know from the human genetic data. So we're still working on that. I think what we might have identified is just sort of a piece of a developmental pathway that relies on NR2D for a specific step and that NR2D may be playing a lot of other roles that contribute to epilepsy that we haven't really uncovered yet. So what we're working on now is can we, can we play with the system and can we like mimic the effects of NR2D or um, counteract the effects of NR2D by activating or inactivating developing GABAergic interneurons? And we've begun a collaboration with um, Jordan Dimishkin at the Broad, who is uh, making all kinds of cool viruses. He came up uh, in uh, about three or four years ago with a a promoter, human DLX56 promoter that lets you virally transduce developing interneurons. Um, this was one of the first tools that allowed you um, access using viral tools to GABAergic cells. And you can see from this paper um, from a few years ago, here's labeling with the, G, with the DLX56 virus. It labels parvalbumin, somatostatin, a VIP. It labels all interneurons, but it's a tool for us that um, it lets us introduce things like dreads optogenetics, uh, manipulate um, flocks animals, things like that. So the last few months, we spent a lot of time trying to get these tools up and running in the neonatal brain. Everything that Jordan did was focused on adult, and so we're trying to validate, validate these in neonates. So what we've done is we've started doing viral injections in P0 pups, which is um, challenging, but there's some protocols out there. If anyone's interested in neonatal virus um, induction, let me know. I'm happy to share our battle scars with you. Um, in this case, what we're doing is focal injection into PFC, since we think that's where this uh, pre-pulse inhibition phenotype originates, with, um, in this case, just a reporter virus of Ruby. And I'll kind of zoom in on three regions, the PFC, where we're targeting, somatosensory sensory cortex and hippocampus. And what you can see is that these little red dots here are transduced GABAergic interneurons. So what we can do is we can get expression of our viral constructs within a week after expression, giving us this ability to, to manipulate things in a critical window that we're interested in, which is about P7. It also shows us that even at P0, we can get some degree of spatial specificity. We've got cells in PFC that are transduced, but not in hippocampus and somatosensory cortex. So that's important if we want to address the role of UN2D in different brain regions. So what we've begun to do is just develop these chemogenetic tools to make sure that we can come in and manipulate these developing interneurons. So we started with um, GI coupled DREAD, which allows you to inhibit interneurons. You can see even by P7 to P9, only a week after infection, we can hyperpolarize and deactivate developing interneurons with CNO, the DREAD ligand. Um, we can change firing rates of these cells. So here what we want to ask is, can we um, focally inhibit GABAergic interneurons using DREADs, and can that help us replicate some of the gluN2D findings? 
all of our drugs hit the entire brain. They hit all different, you know, C and D together, which C does something, you know, it, it's, it's playing a role somewhere. Here's a way where we can ask, what if we just shut off developing interneurons for a few days in the PFC? Can we replicate some of these changes, both in synaptic function and behavior? And potentially more interesting, we're trying to do the opposite as well. Can we come in and globally shut down interneurons with a drug like gluon 2 d antagonists like DQP, and then come back and focally reactivate interneurons in a specific brain region. So we can do that. Um, oh, sorry, this should say excitatory dreads, apologies. This is a GQ coupled dread. And here's an example where we've patched a spontaneously firing interneuron. To mimic DQP, we've given a negative current injection just to kind of slow down the firing rate of the cell. And then we've given CNO to activate the excitatory dread. And you can see we can kick up the firing rate, um, even in the presence of this um, suppression of excitation. So there, what we're going to try to do is reactivate these developing interneurons and see if we can counteract the effects of gluon 2D. And for us, like the dream experiment would be, can you get behavioral changes? Can you rescue behavioral changes caused by in vivo drug treatment by reactivating a subset of neurons in a particular brain region? So that's kind of our goal there. So to conclude, We've looked over the years and seen that in the neonatal brain, there's a permissive glutamate environment created by in immature astrocytes. Um, we've shown that gluN2D is activated thanks to that permissive environment, and it um, helps drive the maturation of PV cells. And what we're working on now is that we think gluN2D drives excitation, at least of all MGE interneurons, SST and PV. And we think it plays a much broader role than just acting directly on um, the PV cells to depolarize them. What we're going to do moving forward is, you know, we're very interested in the downstream targets. What does gluon 2D do? Does it change transcription? Is there specific calcium signaling events and um, kinases that are activated, things like that? We're very interested in whether CGE drive interferons are also tonically depolarized. And I think I'm particularly excited about this because when you read the literature, MGE drive interferons, they don't even express that much NMDA receptor. Um, CG express the most. Um, they kind of highlighted this, can we counteract the drug effects by manipulating um, interneurons with dreads? Um, we're using imaging to see if glen 2 d uh, coordinates early network oscillations. Um, and does that lead to changes in connectivity? These are all kind of downstream functional consequences that we're interested in exploring. I, for a long time, have been interested in early life insult. So does any early life insult alter the glen 2 d signal? And finally, you know, uh, in a lot of cases, you see mutations in humans don't lead to seizures in mice. So um, that could be the case here. And we're interested in, can we, can we use mice to explore um, gluon 2D, 2D related epilepsies? And um, you know, maybe this drug treatment is just scratching the surface. There's you know, knockouts, conditional knockouts, humanized mice. We're, we're very interested in thinking that through in the long run to better understand the role of gluon 2D. So I'll stop there. I want to thank everyone who did this work, especially Moritz, Zinn, Saptorna, Mary, and Lena, whose work I didn't directly highlight, and um, all of our funding. And thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun sharing our work with you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. That's fantastic. So, so I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. So people, please do use the Q&A function. Um, Chris, can I jump in there? Um, so there's a very interesting story from Oscar Marin's lab that reports a wave of death of MGE derived into neurons around the same time your phenomenon is mm -hmm. apparent. Uh, I don't think they have a mechanism and I think they've explored it in the opposite direction from you. I think they've used the excitatory dreads to push the system, to, to push the excitatory cells. And I think that their argument is that is that the excitatory neurons, presumably through glutamate, leads to death of these MGE cells. Um, so the obvious question, I suppose, is have you looked, have you done any counting of interneurons to see if you, if you are seeing the opposite effect? Are you seeing an increased density, even though your interneurons seem to have a simplified arborization and you have a decrease in spontaneous iPSCs in the principal cells after the, the drug treatment? But have you looked at cell counts to see if you can, if, if it aligns in any way with, with their phenomenon? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I really love that work. And I know some of the work that they and others are doing to try to manipulate things by manipulating activity. Um, so we've thought a lot about it. Short answer is we don't see gross changes in PV, PV positive interneurons. Um, so I don't know if we're affecting survival of cells that much. Um, but the caveat is, you know, we've only looked in somatosensory cortex. 
And we think that a lot of these effects may be more prominent in other brain regions. So we're, we're still thinking about it. And I think you're right. I, I also don't have a good handle on how the mechanism from excitatory neuron activity to inner neuron survival really functions. And in other projects in the lab, we're also working on a different model um, of infantile spasms. And we see that manipulating early excitation through genetic mutation um, that affects excitatory cell activity can absolutely change the number of um, surviving interneurons. So I think, you know, in that case, it maybe would support synaptic excitation rather than this tonic activation. Uh, maybe there's some separation of downstream signaling mechanisms like, that link to maturation versus survival. Um, but it's a great question. It's something we're thinking a lot about for sure. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. We have already four questions. The first one is uh, Emre Yaxi, that if he wants to ask the question in person, he can now. Uh, hey, Chris, great talk. I was just curious about uh, the ambient glutamate. You made a statement about, it. maybe I misunderstood, but I thought your statement says that ambient glutamate preferentially acts on these inhibitory neurons. Uh, how certain can we be? I mean, how, how, how do we know that it doesn't act on excitatory cells, principal cells? Um, I, I couldn't understand what was the evidence that it's preferentially for the inhibitory mm. Okay, well, thanks, Emre, good question. Thanks for being here, it's good to see you. Um, the evidence is coming really from the, um, the NMDA receptor um, expression. So to sense ambient glutamate, you have to have um, some receptor that can be activated at very low levels of glutamate. And so GLUN2D fits the bill, whereas this receptor is expressed by um, excitatory cells, they don't express NR2D. So they don't have a receptor that's activated um, at the level of glutamate that's in the extracellular space at that age. They're just not sensitive enough. So I should qualify that statement though, and you, you might be catching me out on a detail, which is that there may be other ways that ambient glutamate acts on excitatory neurons. For example, MGLUARs can be quite high yeah, affinity. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was getting at. Uh, thank you for yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't ruled out that possibility. Um, and yeah, we don't really manipulate MGLUARs in any of these experiments. It's a, it's a good thought. We really just focus on this NMDA part. So you're right. The ambient glutamate could be doing things through MGLUARs expressed um, uh, by excitatory neurons. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the question. That's definitely it. Good catch. So then now we have another question from Jonathan Comfort. Hi, Johnny. And uh, Johnny, you can speak if you want. Uh, yeah, I guess my question is just what I um, wrote, which is you hear a lot about depolarizing GABA early during development. And I was just wondering how, um, how this kind of all fits in, in, in with that. That's a great question. Yeah, the, the time window, I mean, anyone studying interneurons in development knows like everything happens from P7 to P9. All of these happen are, are happening right on top of each other. So we haven't looked like, for example, does, does NR2D shape expression of KCC2 or something like that? Or um, does NR2D shape, you know, um, lead to actually changes in hyperpolarizing versus depolarizing GABA? Um, what I do feel pretty confident saying is that interneurons, I believe, at this age, have already started to express KCC2. So the interneuron itself should have already been having hyperpolarizing GABA. Whether that means that GABA acting on pyramidal cells is also affected by this gluon 2D signal, I don't have the data. Um, but I don't think, like for example, I don't think that gluon 2D acting on interneurons directly links to KCC2 expression in pyramidal cells. But, but maybe there's something to do with the activity of um, the interneurons and activity dependent expression of KCC2 in pyramidal cells. Yeah, you're right, all this stuff is happening right in that time window and we haven't specifically looked at it, but it's a good question. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Johnny. Next question is Christophe Bernard. Christophe, if you want to ask the question, you're live. All right, uh, fantastic talk, Chris. Uh, very clear, very interesting. Uh, in fact, my question is uh, linked to the previous one from uh, Jonathan. Um, so I don't know much about development, but I seem to remember that uh, the general scheme is that uh, for the stabilization of uh, GABAergic synapses, uh, GABA itself acts as a trophic factor 
um, producing, for example, rising uh, calcium. And uh, when this is blocked, uh, there is a, a retraction of the uh, or disappearance of GABAergic synapses. And I wonder whether these could provide one missing link to explain uh, synapse uh, of GABAergic synapse stabilization at this stage. Because if uh, ambient glutamate uh, is depolarizing, uh, well, it does depolarize your uh, neurons, then that would trigger the release of GABA and maybe contribute to the stabilization of synapses by producing a rise in, uh, uh, in intracellular calcium. Mm -hmm. Now, if you block it, then you don't have a release of GABA anymore. GABA is not acting as a trophic factor and you have a retraction of synapses, which could explain part of what you see. Mm -hmm. uh, there would be a prediction if you do that in vitro, you should be able with a simple uh, immunohistomic chemistry to see the disappearance or the loss of some GABAergic synapses and the mobilization of microglia, which will be uh, involved in uh, removing the synapses. Sorry for the long uh, question. No. <laughs> Thanks, Christoph. I always like your questions. It's always fun to chat with you. That's a great, great thought. Um, I haven't, I hadn't really integrated that idea into my thinking, but um, it seems like an obvious connection. So thanks for bringing it up. The thing that we have been thinking a lot about is like looking at these ensembles and, you know, you and a lot of other people have showed that there's distinct patterns of activity um, within ensembles of neurons early in development and different ensembles are active at different times, driven by different um, things that promote their activity. So one thing we've thought about is using some new imaging tools like GABA sniffer, which we started using in the lab. It's a pretty, pretty decent tool. I like it a lot. And to see, you know, can we see groups of inner neurons activate with like GCAMP? And then can we see a GABA wave sort of in that area? And where is it? What neurons does it affect? Um, so I have thought about it from that angle, but I really like the addition of the uh, GABA as a trophic factor. Um, and the microglia, that's something we could easily test. Um, and it does provide, I mean, the, the way you kind of laid it out, it makes a lot of sense, you know, linking glutamate at NR2G, activating interneurons to lead to GABA to promote GABA stabilization. It's, it's a great suggestion. Thanks for bringing that up. I'll have to think about that and see if I can design an experiment or get Zen to do an experiment to test your idea. I like it. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Christoph. We have another other two questions. First one is Karen Wilcox. Welcome back, Karen. <laughs> yeah, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, hi Chris, lovely job, very beautiful work as always. Um, I'm still trying to wrap my brain around the loss of function and gain of function of Grin 2 d you mentioned early on, both yeah. causing seizures, and I might have missed it, but what are your thoughts on that in a nutshell? <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's a good question. I, I I do a lot of hand waving around that one because like our data suggests, like we're basically probing a loss of function, right? NR2D is not active and you get these inner neurons um, not having a mature phenotype. The, the initial papers that came out on human fluent 2 d mutation suggested that they were mostly gain of function. So either enhanced binding of glutamate or they don't gate properly, they flow current like crazy, they drive activity. So it's, it's easy to imagine that an NR2D receptor that's just firing like, like crazy, passing tons of current could lead to epilepsy either through ex, um, killing cells. And if it's on interneurons, it could you know, excitotoxically kill the interneurons that it's expressing leading to loss of that GABAergic tone. Um, so that kind of, that mechanism, it does make a lot of sense. It's not exactly what we're probing here, but for sure it makes sense to have a gain of function mutation lead to epilepsy for an NMDA receptor. When a few more papers started coming out that started to do like structure function relationships between these mutations and what they did. And to, to be fair, these are all most, these are mostly all done in expression systems. So there's some caveats, but what they mostly found was that there was a big down regulation of the expression of the protein, whether or not the protein, what the mutation seemed to lead to a gain or loss of function. So if you have a gain function mutation that makes the receptor super active, but it also leads to internalization of the receptor, then you end up scratching your head. Is this a gain of function or a loss of function? Um, so that that's my best understanding of the field at the moment. So there's definitely a, a recept, there's definitely mutations that are clear loss of function. There's less expression, less surface stability and decreased 
um, like gating or lower affinity. So every aspect of the mutation should lead to loss of function. But there's some where it's not so clear where you would have like massively active NR NR2D or NMD receptors suggesting gain of function, but the receptor just doesn't stay on the surface. So it leads to loss. It makes you, makes you scratch your head and ask, is this a loss or gain of function? Yeah. Right. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, I'll be confused. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Karen. And the last question for now is from Carre Clement. And Okay, just she just say that the she cannot talk because the mic, mic is dead. So we can read the question for you. Is NR2D able to form ether tetramer with NR, uh, NR2A in the young brain or same question in adult brain? If yes, could some effect you describe be due to the loss of the NR2A, NR2D formation? Great question, yeah. I think the answer is we don't know for sure, but we probably would, based on work from Steve Trinalis, he's really the expert on, on all the subunit composition in pharmacology. Um, my best guess would be that NR2D always exists with an NR2B, probably not with an NR2A, and probably not as a homomer with two NR2Ds. So when you're using drugs that block NR2D, you're probably hitting receptors that are both 2B and 2D. Um, I think that's the, my understanding of the data is that's the most likely confirmational organization, um, but I think it's not 100% known, um, but I think it's unlikely that it's with A. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, if there aren't any other questions, uh, well, thank you once more, but before doing so, just to announce the next talk is by Ethan Goldberg in two weeks, Cellular Circuit Dysfunction Across Development in a Model of Dravet Syndrome. So um, uh, that that's, brings our talk to an end. Uh, so once more, thank you for a fantastic talk. Thank you guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks for organizing this. And thanks to all the people who showed up and asked questions. It was really fun. I had a great time. And we hope to see as many as possible of you in two weeks' time. Bye. Thanks, Dimitri. Thanks, Gabriel. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.